Hello, my name is Phil Spence. I am the administrator of the Hernando County Health Department and the Nature Coast Community Health Center, which is located at the health department. It is important that all of our citizens and visitors have access to health-related information. Our Healthy Hernando programs will help you stay up to date on many health topics. We will share tips, guidelines, and local resources for improving your health and the health of your family. If you have questions about anything on today's show, please call or visit the health department or visit our website. The addresses and phone numbers will appear on the screen throughout the program. Thank you for supporting your local health department and for helping us better serve you. We hope you enjoy today's topic. and welcome to Healthy Hernando. My name is Ann Gale Ellis. I'm a health educator with the Hernando County Health Department. Today's topic is the Strategic National Stockpile, and I have Nina Matei, who's an emergency planner with the Hernando County Health Department, and I also have Corporal Bert Stockton with the Hernando County Sheriff's Office. And today, I'm really excited about this topic. It's one that, um, when I was a little girl, I never dreamed that I'd be <laughs> in a career talking about the Strategic National Stockpile. But I found it to be very interesting, and that's why I've asked these two to join me today to talk about it. So um, let's just jump right in. Nina, welcome. Thank you. Corporal, welcome. Thank you. Um, first of all, let's let's talk a little bit about um, post 911, okay? Okay. And why it is we do all the different kinds of things we do now that we didn't do, say, 20 years ago. So can you talk just a minute about? your position at the health department and how you sure. fit into a group of people in the community? Yeah. I think that what happened with 9-11 is that it, it really helped us to focus and it really helped us to really open our eyes to a lot of different ways that we could be better prepared. And so I think over the years what we've done is we've, you know, really looked at what are all the threats and the risks and then what are what are the ways that we can be better prepared and then what are the ways that we can respond better so we protect the community in a more um, complete way. Mm -hmm. So I think that those are the really the, the longest lessons learned. Okay. Yeah. And um, here in Florida, hurricane season is one of the ways that we exercise our preparedness. Mm -hmm. And I know at the health department, um, Nina mm -hmm. always impresses on us prepared for one disaster, prepared for any disaster. So it's, right. we don't just talk hurricanes at the health department. We we talk about all, all, all hazards. All hazards, that's right, right. thank you. Um, Bert is here today because he represents one of many community partners that also are very involved in community preparedness. Um, we also work um, with fire yep. rescue, with emergency management, and we're going to talk about those different partners a little bit later, but Bert was kind enough to, to join us today because he's been very involved in the stockpile um, exercises we've been doing here in the community. So who, amongst all of the two of you, wants to just introduce the concept of the strategic national stockpile? We could kind of point to each other and... Uh, okay. Uh, yeah. okay. Who's got Pass the bigger the pointer? <laughs> oh, Bert wins. Okay. Bert wins. Nina, you have to tell us. Tell okay. us about it. So the strategic national stockpile is one of many federal assets that we might um, request and make use of in a disaster or an emergency. And what the stockpile is, is it's a collection of medical equipment and supplies and it includes um, intravenous supplies, burn injury, crush injury supplies, medicine, antibiotics, antitoxins. Um, and what's pretty unique about it is that we could request the whole stockpile if we needed all of those items or we could request parts of it. For a particular, you know, say that uh, we had an outbreak of illness, then we could request just part of the medicine or if we had a, uh, a large disaster or a terrorist attack and a lot of people were injured, we could request the surgical and crush injury supplies. So it's very adaptable to what the situation is. Okay, so for example, the 9-11 mm -hmm. incident. Um, obviously, or I shouldn't say obviously, I'm assuming the strategic national stockpile right. wasn't in place at that time. Well, it actually, in 1999, Congress created the, the idea of the stockpile, uh -huh. and then the Centers for Disease Control was given the task of creating it, and then eventually it became part of the Department of um, Health and Human Services and then the Department of Homeland Security. 
So it's been around since 1999. Okay, so then is it safe to assume that the 9-11 um, responders requested the right. at least parts of the strategic national stockpile when, yes. when we had the attack right. there? That's exactly right. In fact, those were some of the only planes that were flying that day were planes that were delivering the stockpile to New York City. So what happens is that it can be, it can be requested as an event is, is growing and happening. Um, it could be like a disease outbreak and we see people getting sick and, and more and more cases arising and we could start requesting it. Or it could be when there's you know, a big disaster, a lot of injuries, it can start you know, that process of, of being deployed on our behalf. Now, is there one big strategic stockpile somewhere? Are they strategically located throughout the country, or how is yeah. that? They're, they're strategically located in 10 or 12 different places, and each one of them is enormous. It's 50 tons of medical equipment and supplies. And so when you say 50 tons, you're like, okay, that sounds like a lot. But what it looks like is it's a whole jumbo jet, or it's 8 or 12 tractor trailers. So it's a lot of supplies and a lot of equipment, and it's not like you have one item, you know, one, one surgical kit or one stock of antibiotics. There's hundreds and thousands of those items. Mm -hmm. And so each stockpile is pretty much the same, but like I said before, it's packaged so that we could receive just parts of it. And at the very beginning, they'll send us what's called a 12-hour push package. It'll arrive within 12 hours to the state and then within six more hours to our local area. And it might come on a truck, it might come on an airplane, depending on what the event is and depending on what we've requested. Okay. Um, okay, that's pretty cool. I mean, I just think this is such a fascinating <laughs> topic. But there's so much more, so I'm just going to keep going and you guys just, however you want to answer them. Um, the next question I have is, who decides that we're going to call up whoever we call up, and who do we call up? Right. Yeah, and it's a pretty um, it's a pretty laid out process. It, um, what happens is that the for from a health department perspective, we start working with our community partners. It might be working with um, emergency management and law enforcement and our county officials if we start seeing cases of illness pop up. And then what we do is we do an assessment of what the impact is or what the threat is, or maybe the sheriff's department receives you know. A, a threat from uh, a group or a person saying we're going to do this or that or we have done this or that to injure people. And then what the Department of Health does is we talk with our counterparts in Tallahassee and they confer at the highest levels of government and then they talk with the Centers for Disease Control and once we all agree that we have either a threat that's imminent or we have an event that has happened and we've got so many people who are ill or sick or injured then they start sending us resources from the stockpile. Okay. Yeah. So okay. It, it always starts at the local level. It always starts with a, a local community assessment. Okay. Now you just referenced law enforcement, mm -hmm. and I just want to um, talk a little bit about why I've included you today, Bert. You're kind of my representative of community partners. But tell us how, uh, what law enforcement's role is in the strategic national stockpile. Well. Uh, Nina first contacted my office uh, probably when we st on the very early stages right. of um, making our plan for Hernando County and the reason was to identify certain locations to uh, dispense the medications and what were what are called pods mm -hmm. the uh, points, of points of dispensing uh, I get confused with the points of dispensing and points of distribution because right. they're two different. But uh, so that's how I got involved in it. Was on the onset we needed to identify the various locations throughout the county. We had several locations that we had identified in the early stages. Then uh, we had to sit down and go through a process of elimination because there was just so many. Mm -hmm. They're all. Some had different qualities, different features about a different site. So we went through the pros and the cons, the process of elimination, and threw some out and then kept certain pod sites based on criteria that we needed. Mm -hmm. uh, some of that criteria was uh, easy flow in and easy flow out for the public so that we could get them into the pod site and then out efficiently, safely, effectively. Mm -hmm. 
there were some security concerns with some sites as well. And uh, I'm not so sure how involved I'm going to get into the security end no, of it. No, that's fine, but, yeah. But uh, uh, there are a lot of security concerns about each of the sites as well that, that we had to discuss and, uh, to make it in the best interest of the public, the pod site itself, and the safety of everybody. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I would imagine if we're talking about the quantity of people, and, and we're going to get into talking about who comes to pods and who doesn't, I would imagine just the presence of law enforcement from a community member standpoint would be very reassuring. I imagine you guys play a lot of different roles in a, in a situation like this, uh, the security of the medication, oh, sure. the security of the mm -hmm. sites, the, the safety. That was all sites. part of the process and, you know, the, uh, uh, in building these things up is what are what is the role of law enforcement going to be and yes there will be uh, from the moment that the the medication gets moved from the, the initial secured facility to the pod site then there's going to be another role for law enforcement once the pod site gets stood up there's going to be even prior to standing that site up there's going to be certain things happening with law enforcement and then during the process or the uh, pod process, uh, law enforcement will still be on site. And if things go bad during uh, the dispensing, uh, there's a plan in place for that as well. So yeah, that's reassuring. Very well thought out. And one of the one of the things we're doing by like for this program is we don't want things to go bad. We want to get out in the community and educate on what the plan is. Oh, absolutely. We yeah. we certainly want everything to go as smooth as possible, but Unfortunately, we do have to have plan B. the plan B, <laughs> yeah. absolutely. Nina, do you want to add something? Yeah, I think that what's really important about what we're doing today is that we're letting people know what to expect. What is a point of dispensing going to look like? Why, you know, why would I go there? What can I expect? What should I bring? What am I going to get? How long is it going to take? So I think by explaining that to folks, they can better anticipate, oh, okay, that's familiar. I understand that. That makes sense. It sounds like a flu clinic that I went to. Mm -hmm. um, and it really is actually set up a lot like a flu clinic. If you've ever been where, you know, we're giving out shots, um, you know, you come in, you'll fill out some information, you'll talk to a medical provider, and then, you know, you'll get your flu shot, or in this case, you'll get medicine, and then you'll be given information to take home with you. And the process, you know, hopefully will not take too long, you know, and, and with law enforcement and with a lot of other partners, you know, it'll be very clear how to get in, how to get out, where to park, who to talk to. Um, and, of course, you'll, you'll play a big role in helping us get that information out to the public also, also with right. public information. Right. As a matter of fact, all the public information. I mean, everybody brings people to the table that are involved in this, and, and everybody's involved in the exercises. I want to back up just a minute. I wish I'd have done this before I started talking to you, Bert. Um, I know Nina's role at the health department is emergency planner. Is your role similar to her at the health, I mean, at the sheriff's office? Are you in charge of emergent, or not, I shouldn't say emergency planning, because you guys, that'd be an everyday affair, I'm sure, at the, health, at the sheriff's office. But are you in charge of uh, the planning of bad things happening that are outside of the norm or whatever the terminology is? Yes, I do get very involved in a lot of the planning with the sheriff's office and then partners such as emergency management the health department so uh, nina and i we've been working together very close for probably the last four or six years six years i would yeah. say yeah pushing six um so and then we're very familiar with the emergency management people as well so we well the emergency management is now a part of the sheriff's office but even before that you know we were still all very familiar with each other and then the fire rescue gets brought in to the table as well. So, and it's generally the same people. We're all like a little group, <laughs> and uh, <laughs> and we get together and we sit down and and come up with plans. And, uh, yeah. We also do a lot of training exercises with all these other uh, first responders and emergency management. CERT gets involved. Uh, the hospitals, the school district. Right. Um, Swift, part, mud, yeah. Swift, yeah, the water management district, uh, the utilities department, transportation department, electric. I mean, all of those things that go into keeping a community functioning, 
that's all part of the, the people that we plan with and the people that we train with as well. Yeah, I'm not sure that Hernando County, the general community, realizes how much behind the scenes preparedness goes on in this county. And I always, I'm very proud of what you've done at the health department and what the county has done in, in partnership. Mm -hmm. um, certainly if we had a bad thing happen, I, I think that we would have our challenges, but I feel mm -hmm. very secure in, in the, the things that I know that, have already, that are already right. in place. Mm -hmm. um, I want to, okay, all of a sudden I, got, I have a million things I want to make sure that we say. So I want to <laughs> make sure and mention the actual emergency preparedness, or the emergency management um, entity at the mm -hmm. Sheriff's Department. I want to make sure and talk about them because they obviously are a huge piece of the puzzle in, in this. Um, but I also want to talk about um, something else that I seem to have forgotten. So I'm sure it'll come back to me in a minute. Let's talk real quick about okay. emergency management, just sure. to say how, see how they fit in here real quick. I think what's really important about emergency management is that they help coordinate a lot of these things on our behalf. By working with them, by doing our plans together, they're going to help us to get transportation that we need. If we need buses or trucks or vehicles, they're going to help us get staff and volunteers. They'll be a, they'll play a big part in um, training and then assigning those volunteers for us. So the biggest thing is that we're not in it alone. If if we had a, an outbreak of illness or if we had a um, a natural disaster or uh, an event that was human caused and we needed a lot of assistance, we needed a lot of supplies and equipment, you know, we, the health department, don't have to go out and get all of that stuff on our own. Emergency management is going to do a lot of that behind the scenes work for us. Mm -hmm. They're going to make sure that, you know, after we tell them what we need, they're going to make sure that we get it. And, and, that's, and that's really important because then we can keep doing public health and health and medical. The sheriff's department can continue doing law enforcement. So they really support our efforts. Right. And I, you bring up a, an important partner in our group that we didn't mention, I don't think. It's the CERT, the CERT team. Yes. Can one of you take a minute and talk a little bit sure. about CERT? Yeah. And actually, this might be a good promotional <laughs> opportunity to, yeah. to recruit some volunteers. So, Bert, are you comfortable talking about CERT? Uh, I can talk a little bit about it, yeah, as much as I know, I think. Uh, CERT is the uh, Community Emergency Response Team. It is a volunteer group of people. Uh, it's overseen through the emergency management office and uh, they're very, very well trained in different areas. Uh, they, they, can they, do, they can do search and rescue, they can do some searching. They help out with searching, they uh, certainly assist with traffic control. Um, They've been working on some medical um, A lot of them are trained skills. in medical where they can do blood pressure, they can, you know, first aid basically, yep, you know. I think that, as a matter of fact, you have a number of retired either firefighters, police, or healthcare personnel on that team, if I'm not Correct. mistaken. Yes. So that's yeah. a great yes. resource. Yes. And they help with exercises, too, I, if oh, I'm not mistaken. Oh, they're a huge help, yeah. So if we need yeah. role players, you know, they can come out. And then, like I said, some of them have experience in first responding field, so they bring that knowledge to the, uh, the training exercise to make it as realistic yeah. as possible. Yeah. Do they go through a vetting process? Do they have to be fingerprinted and background checked and mm -hmm. things like I that? I do believe they do, yes. Yeah. 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 Yep. All right, so, well, for anybody out there who has an interest in that kind of thing, I, uh, you can contact the Emergency Management Office mm -hmm. of the Sheriff's Department, is that yes. correct? Yes, yep. Okay. There's actually a couple of other um, volunteer groups that people might be interested in. One of them is called Fire Corps, mm -hmm. and it's very much like CERT, but it has more of a, a, fire, um, a fire rescue um, focus. And if folks are interested in Fire Corps, they can call Hernando County Fire Rescue. And they go through a very um, lengthy training and uh, orientation process. And then the other thing that we have available is something called the Medical Reserve Corps. And actually, Pasco County coordinates that for Pasco, Hernando, and Citrus Counties. So if people really want to get um, involved in the medical aspects of disaster preparedness and response, um, they can call me at the health department, and I'll put them in touch with the person at Pasco County. Health okay. Department who's managing that. But I think you bring up a really good point is that there's lots of opportunities for people to get involved. And what works really better is that if people get involved early, they're already part of a group, they've already received their training, they've got all their credentials, and then when we need them, we know exactly what they can do, and then we can place them in the most appropriate place where they can have the biggest impact. 
what we know is that you know during a um, an emergency or a disaster, we're going to have people who volunteer spontaneously. They they want to come out and help and and support the effort, and those are really important as well. It just takes a lot of effort and a lot of work to get them credentialed and then give them just in time training and then find a, an appropriate spot for them. So yeah. the more that people can do ahead of time, the yeah. better. That's going to be a good segue into um, something else that we want to talk a little bit about today. Um, I'll never forget, I went to, this was before Craig Fugate moved up the ladder. He was a local uh, emergency. He was emergency manager. For the state. For yeah. the state and now yes. he's for the country, right? Yep. Yes. Okay, well, and, and if anybody ever has an opportunity to see him speak, he's an awesome speaker. He, he speaks on my level, which is good. I get it. And, um, and I, but I trust him. I mean, I trust everything he says. But anyway, he said, um, the, the, who's the fir he asked the group, who's the first responder in an emergency? And he said, really, it's the person right next door. We really are all each other's first responder because in a real big emergency, the chances of EMS or law enforcement getting to you at your house right. may not may not happen. It might and, not and happen very quickly. Right. So we need to be relying on each other. So sometimes a person's volunteer efforts might be best served right there in his own neighborhood or right. his own community. And that's right. actually the basis of CERT is to get neighborhoods working together. And CERT is something like um, the old Civil Defense Corps from the 1940s and the 1950s. But, but the whole point of it is, is that a neighborhood or a community takes care of itself, at least from that, you know, right after the event happens. They gather everybody together. They find out who's OK. They find out who needs help. They provide what help they can. And then that puts them in a much better position when, you know, emergency services can finally reach them. Mm -hmm. Okay, if you're wondering where the segue was in that whole conversation. <laughs> I was just going to go with it, wherever you want to go. I appreciate it. That's the the, <laughs> with the most. <laughs> anyway. We're along for let, the ride. Yeah, let's, let's talk about how the, um, the person in the neighborhood can help if it came to a um, uh, strategic national stockpile distribution issue. Sure. Um, where I was going with that is let's talk about who comes to yeah, I've totally gotten off track, so let's bring okay, it back to this. No, but I see where you're going. Okay, so can you take it from there? I can take it from okay, there. Okay, go. One of the ways that we can distribute medicine is that we can, we, the health department and some of our community partners, we can do that all ourselves. But we don't have enough staff. We don't even have enough volunteers to do that. So a more effective and a more efficient way is to partner with community groups. And it might be that we partner with a neighborhood association or a homeowners association, a CERT group, um, fire corps, and then they help us distribute medicine within their group. Mm -hmm. And so the way that would work is um, in a neighborhood, you know, we might have an agreement with a CERT team that, that is in a particular gated community, let's say. And what we do is we say, if we, um, if we have an outbreak of illness, you know, will you help us distribute medicine only to the people who live in your neighborhood? And they say, yeah, we can do that. And then we work with them to train them how to do that. They fill out all the medical forms. They bring those back to the health department. We look at those forms. We give them the medicine. They bring it back to their neighborhood and they distribute it. Mm -hmm. So what happens is that, let's say that that community has 500 people. That's 500 fewer people who come to one of those open pods. So they receive their medicine at their clubhouse or you know, at their agent, um, their neighborhood association office, instead of having to leave their neighborhood and go somewhere else, they get it right there. Mm -hmm. So it's very convenient for the people who live in that community, and, and we really encourage that. And we've made some arrangements with a few of our, our communities, um, some of our CERT programs, and, uh, and that just makes it a, a much more efficient and uh, effective way to distribute medicine. Mm -hmm. Um, and the one thing that we didn't mention actually is why would we be distributing medicine? What would have happened? And one of the scenarios that we use is that um, a group or a person has released anthrax into the community. And that's a very unlikely event and it's actually a very difficult thing to accomplish. But if they did do that, we would have about 48 hours to get medicine to people. And so we would do that a couple of different ways. We would have our open pods, which Bert and I were talking about where the general public would come, but we would also have closed pods. And what we're doing is we're, we're really trying to recruit businesses, 
community groups, civic groups, education, lots of different folks who would distribute medicine on our behalf. And right now we've got 16 of those agreements in place, and that represents about 66,000 residents. So out of 170,000, about 66,000 of them would receive medicine at their, where they live or where they work. And so that's a much more organized, much more efficient way to, to go ahead and distribute medicine. Okay. Yeah. Now, um, so are we looking for more? We're always looking for more. Okay. So Absolutely. if there's a, a person out there who is, let's say, the chairman of a, a, a neighborhood association mm -hmm. who said that's something we might want to be a part of. Right they could contact you at the health department. That would be great. Okay. Yeah. Yep. Just because of the resources that are involved in setting up a pod, if you had the yeah. closed pod, those are less resources that we as the first responders have right. to provide. Right. So it yeah. takes the burden off from us a lot. and We can right. focus on other areas. Right. And, uh, and we can really focus on, on folks who maybe live in a, an area that doesn't have a, a neighborhood group or maybe um, you know, they, they live in, in just an area that might be a little bit inaccessible or whatever. Maybe we have to deliver medicine to people who are homebound. So like Bert says, we can then focus our resources on people who, yeah. who have a, a significant need. Not to mention, it's that many cars that aren't on the street. It's, right. it's so much. And, so. and plus, the, you know, the less bodies roaming around during a time like that, the better. Yeah. Um, okay, so let's talk about... a. a I'm sorry, um, go ahead. Oh, I'm sorry. What I wanted to say is that um, it, it doesn't only have to be a, a neighborhood association that wants to be a, a point of dispensing. It could be a business. Maybe it's a bank. Maybe it's a retailer. Maybe it's a, a group of grocery stores. Um, we're more than glad to work with any kind of businesses or business associations um, and then have them distribute medicine to, to their members or their, their staff and families. Yeah. So it, it doesn't have to be a, a real structured sort of um, entity. It can be a group of people. Um, but we just need to know that, that they can do it and that they're organized and that they'll get all the forms filled out correctly and stuff. And we'll help them yeah. get to that point. So let's talk about the people who aren't in a pod, mm -hmm. okay, who aren't, a, 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 aren't associated with a closed pod, because that's the definition of a closed pod, right? right? right. Okay. Right. The nine or ten or however many we would set up from the public health, law enforcement, EMS, mm -hmm. emergency management structure, those are called open pods, right? Right. Okay. And those are where people would come to get the medication. Right for their family, for just themselves, who, is, who would be coming to an pot, yeah. open pod? Yeah, you make a great point. What we've done is we've picked locations that are in all different areas of the county, north, south, east, and west, rural areas, very populated areas. So we tried to get a mix of these eight different points of dispensing. Some are at schools, some are at community centers, they're at a variety of places. But like what Bert said is that all of them have good in and out lots of good traffic flow because we know there's going to be a lot of people coming. The other thing is that we really want to encourage people to not bring their whole family with them. For instance, if you have um, a spouse and three children, we would want just you to come to the pod and pick up your medicine for your spouse and your three children. And let's say you're very close with your neighbor or a couple of neighbors, we would actu actually want you to come and pick up medicine on their behalf. So instead of five people from your street coming to pick up their medicine, maybe only you go, but you have to bring all of their, the medical forms filled out for all those people, and then you're responsible for taking the medicine back to them. Mm -hmm. But what's really important about it is that instead of having five or six or seven or ten people from your street coming through the pod, we only have one. Right. So that really helps with the traffic and the congestion, and it would make it go so much more quickly. Mm -hmm. you know. Instead of talking to all of those people, we're just going to talk to you. You're going to hand, hand us all of those medical forms. We're going to make sure everything is correct and then give you the medicine and you take it back. Now, where does that form come from? The form comes with some guidance from the state. And then what we do is we look at what other counties are using and then we pick the best of those and we come up with our medication form. It's very simple. And the really actually the hallmark of all of this is that it's a humanitarian mission. Our job is to get medicine to people. And so what we're not going to do is we're not going to insist that people bring a, uh, a driver's license or any kind of identification. We're not going to insist that they give us a long health history. What we want is we want your name, your age, your weight, and then if you have any particular allergies, 
and if you're taking a particular set of uh, medicines that might interact with the uh, um, antibiotics that we're handing out. Very simple form to fill out. Um, there's space for 15 different people on each form, but you could bring two forms with you if you had that many people you were picking up medicine for. Mm -hmm. But what really is important is that people understand we want to get medicine to people. We don't want to make it hard. We want to make it easy. Right. Um, so that's why you know, minimal amounts of information we're collecting. Only one person comes from a family or a group of people. And that just makes it go much quicker because you can imagine in 48 hours, that's a very short amount of time to get medicine to 170,000 people. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and we're talking, I mean, we're talking, I, I don't mean to be over dramatic here, but we're talking life or death. So, so right. we don't want people to have to stumble around and go back and forth 100 times. We want right. to get something to everybody. And this would be an oral medication most likely? Right. If we're looking at the anthrax scenario, it's, um, it's antibiotics. They're oral antibiotics. And it would either be doxycycline, Cipro, or amoxicillin. Those are very standard antibiotics. They're very common. Most everybody has had a prescription within their lifetime of one of those three. Mm -hmm. um, they're very powerful antibiotics, and they work very good against something like anthrax, but they would have to get it to people really quickly, yeah. and that's the trick. Yeah. Um, but the other thing is, is that because these are standard common antibiotics, we know what they interact with, other medicines, and we know what those interactions are. So we can, you know, we can get the word out to people saying, if you're on this medicine, you really shouldn't take doxycycline, you should take Cipro. Or if you're pregnant and breastfeeding, you shouldn't take this one, but this other one right. is appropriate. Right. And all of that would be information that would be out in the media, on the internet, on our websites. Um, we would blast that information to all of our community partners. So there would be a lot of information. And then all those forms that we were talking about, the medicine forms, those would be distributed as well. And that's the key. We want people to come to the point of dispensing with their form already filled out, ready to go, and that'll make it go so much quicker. Right. Yeah. Now, Bert, let's say this was the scenario that Nina talked about, and it was an anthrax release. Not only is law enforcement dealing with the safety and security of the medicine and the pods and the distribution, but you guys have also got an investigative thing on your hand from a law enforcement perspective. Is that correct, or would that oh, fall into somebody else's? Well, it would start on the local level, obviously, and then, then it would more than likely be considered a terrorist threat. So then Homeland Security would be involved. FBI would be involved. Mm -hmm. uh, we live in Region 4 of the Regional Domestic Security Task Force, so the task force would be stood up, you know, and the headquarters is in Tampa. So there's going to be a lot going on law enforcement-wise, investigative-wise, but certainly it's going to start at our level because we're the ones that are going to have to pick up the phone and say, send us some help. Mm -hmm. um, and then going along with, with the help need is we can't do all of this on our own, just like Nina has been expressing all along, is we, we're going to need partners. So fortunately, we do live in the state of Florida, and there is a mutual aid pact throughout the state of Florida with all counties, all 67 counties. And then in, uh, what is there, seven regions that have been divided up in throughout the state. We're in region four. So uh, mutual aid is going to play a big role as well uh, if, it's, if it's just localized in our area surrounding uh, law enforcement, fire, rescue people, medical. health department, medical. A lot of people are going to be converging on our area to help us out, you mm -hmm. know, to take care of all these needs. Because our sheriff's office and the Brooksville City Police Department and then the, the Hernando County Fire and Brooksville Fire, we can't handle it all. There's just mm -hmm. no way. So mutual aid is going to be a big, big factor. Yeah. And the other thing to think about, too, in this particular scenario, anthrax, it's where someone has released this into the community, so it's a terrorist event, and it's a health event. But the thing is, is that people are still going to be involved in the things they're involved in every day. There's going to be car accidents. There's going to be petty theft. There's going to be people who have heart attacks and strokes. There's going to be folks who need to go to the grocery store. All of those activities of daily living will continue as well. Right. So all the calls that you guys take every day from uh, police department, from EMS, fire rescue, those are all going to continue as well. So that makes it all the more important to have help coming in as right. well right. to deal with this other whole calamity oh that just goodness. happened. Well, um, you know, that's interesting. We don't think 
I mean, gosh, you guys have a big role. <laughs> <laughs> they do have a big role. <laughs> Let's they talk do. a little bit about first responders and their their personal receipt of medication. Can okay. who wants to? Bert, you got that. Well, first responders as a whole will be taken care of right on the onset for for obvious reasons. It will be medical staff through the hospitals, mm -hmm. I believe, are included mm -hmm. in there. Yep. Your firemen, um, law enforcement basically anybody in the health area mm -hmm. and then uh, we're going to help you know take care of our volunteers that are going to be working in the pods so mm -hmm. that we're all set we're taken care of immunized i guess mm -hmm. you could say protected. protected and then we can start doing our role in getting the uh, medications dispensed mm -hmm. to everybody else mm -hmm. so that's and part of the plan is yeah. get things going and, and that's really important to keeping all of those services in place whether it's electricity roads and bridges utilities um, sanitation, garbage pickup, all of those things that, that happen just because we're really organized and, and all those entities and agencies do that work every day, we need to keep that going. We don't want, you know, just because this terrible event happened, we don't want all these other domino effects to happen. Mm -hmm. So if we can protect those critical infrastructure, um, people in education and utilities and, and all of those folks, if we can keep them working, keep them on the job, then all of the, the things that keep our community running are going to stay in place. Yeah. And that'll make the response all the, all the easier and yeah. all the quicker. And Nina, you and I discovered one recently when we were doing an exercise and we were talking about the extensive amount of copies <laughs> paperwork. of paperwork we were yeah. going to have to have done. So I, I was talking to a local printer and we, we were talking about how he could produce, and of course we'd have partnerships with a number of them, how he could produce the numbers that we would have to have. Right. And he, you know, here's somebody else we don't think about. He would be a real key partner to getting good community education right. out. So he would then become a site that we would want vaccinated mm -hmm. first or protected right. first too to make sure that he can keep his presses going. Right. So it's a, it's a very intricate. There's lots of steps. There's mm -hmm. lots of different ways to get this done. And um, I think that's really the key is that the more of those different uh, the more of those different ways that we engage ourselves, the more effective and efficient, the quicker we're going to get this done. Mm -hmm. The more people we have helping us, the more quickly they're going to get their own medicine. Yeah. So it, it really is a, a benefit to jump in and get involved. Yeah. Um, One of the things I've, I've learned in the last few years in working with you, Nina, and, and working with all the emergency preparedness partners is, is the point of exercise. As you know, as kids, we all participated in fire drills. And, you know, and whenever you check into a hotel on the back of the door, there's the fire exit thing. Right. And it's really become so important to me, um, and I hope that other people will start to grasp this, the, the importance of thinking ahead of time through a process mm -hmm. or actually exercising something. You know, kids are taught to drop, drop, Stop roll, and roll. And yeah, whatever it is. Obviously, really I missed that class. That made a big impression on <laughs> <Yeah>. you. <laughs> but I do know I'm supposed to, to meet out at here. the tree to my family. <laughs> the flagpole. But, you know, kids are encouraged <laughs> to go home and talk to their family about an escape plan. And it's important that we all do this, and that's why we do exercises right. in the lay public and in, in you know, t situations like this. So we don't have that, okay, what are we going to do right. factor. We already have a game plan. Yeah. And I think it's so important if we could get as much of the community engaged in being a part of this process, right. it, it could be a calmer, I mean, we're going to have a little degree of. Sure, people are going to be frustrated. It's yeah. going to be a lot to understand and a lot of things to do. It's going to be unfamiliar. Um, I think probably one of the most common examples, like you said, stop, drop, and roll. Another one is almost all of us have flown on an airplane. And everybody, you know, can have a, a parody and make fun of the stewardess who says the, the exits are here, here, and here. Yeah. And if it drops, pull and put the mask on, you know, oxygen will begin flowing. I mean, we can all say little pieces of that. But research shows that if you really actually stop and turn around and look at the airplane and count the number of seats forward and backward to those exits, then when the plane is full of smoke, you can't see, you can't hardly breathe, you can count those seat backs and you know you're going to get to that door. Yeah. And by doing that, by rehearsing that, you actually set a pathway in your brain and you've got a, a much, much larger chance of surviving that plane crash. So we make fun of it. But really, if you take those extra three seconds and just look around, count the seats and know which way you're going to try to get out of the plane, you've really saved your life, actually. Yeah. And it's not 
as dramatic, but it's, it's similar with the stockpile or a disease outbreak. If you figure out what are we going to do, how are we going to do this, if we work through some of the problems, if we do exercises and we realize, wow, that medication form, that really didn't work. Nobody understood it. The providers couldn't read it. When we faxed it, it all turned, you know, muddy. Yeah. You know, if we practice all of that and we find out what doesn't work, well, then we're going to find out what works. Yeah. And we'll be in such better shape. Now, yeah. do you all do public speaking on this topic? I mean, will you go out to community mm -hmm. groups and talk about this? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Because I'm hopeful that maybe somebody watching today will say, I want to sure. be involved. You know, one of the groups we didn't mention, and it's a really, really important group, is um, churches, faith-based organizations, synagogues. Those are an enormously important part of our community, and they touch the lives of so many people in their congregation. Right. And, um, for instance, Catholic Charities, they do home visits every day to, I think it's 600 people in our county. So that's a very, very large reach, and that's, that's another area where we're trying to do outreach with churches and see if they would be interested in becoming a point of dispensing just for their congregation. Mm -hmm. um, and again, it's, it's a big responsibility for them to take on. And, and there's, of course, some forms to sign and some agreements to sign. And, and there's, like you had said, there's, <coughs> there's forms to fill out and hand back in. But what a service to their, their congregation, what a service to their, their yeah. community. And it could be community groups. It could be an agency that serves the needs of people with special needs, um, hearing, vision, disability. Um, all of those sort of things. Mm -hmm. So we're looking to partner with agencies in all areas of yeah. the county. And that many people who don't show up at the open pods. Sure. And, and you know, how stressful and frustrating of a, any kind of a community event that any of us have been to. It's a lot of people. It's a lot of noise. It's a lot of um, energy and action. And that can be very, you know, disturbing to people. It can be very frustrating. And a lot of people just don't like crowds and noise. So if you can figure out a way that you avoid that, all the yeah. better. Yeah, and yeah. the anxiety of it being the unknown. Right. Um, one thing we haven't touched on is what this costs people to, to do. Do they put this on their credit card? Do they have to have some cash stored away? What, yeah. what, this is one of, those, um, one of those events where really, truly, it is free. There is no cost. Um, it's a humanitarian mission. The idea is to get medicine to the people as quickly as possible so as many people as possible are protected. Um, you know, if, if you are an organization that signs up to be a, a closed pod, you know, what, what we ask is, can you make photocopies of your own forms and the handouts? You know, would you do that for us um, as opposed to us making them and, and then getting them to you? It'd be a whole lot quicker if you, you know, print those up for your own constituents. Um, and then... Um, but if they couldn't, we, would, we still yes. want them to do it. Okay. Right, yeah. because you've already identified the printer who's... Protected I didn't and identify him. <laughs> <laughs> but you know who he is. <laughs> yeah. So, but the more that we can spread this out, yeah. the quicker, the easier it, it's going to be. But really, honestly, the medicine is free. There's no charge at all for it. Okay. It's free to everybody. So that's not going to be a barrier. No, that's not a barrier at all. Okay. Not Very at good. All. Yeah. Um, this, um, to me, we talk so much in the course of the year about having a kit. Uh, having a disaster preparedness kit, an all hazards kit, is would that apply to this kind of a uh, incident? In this sort of a situation, I, I think how it applies is you really want to think about where am I going to go to get my medicine? Am I going to go to that open pod or am I linked in with a group that is a closed pod? Um, I think that those are the considerations. Mm -hmm. The other consideration really is knowing your health and medical history mm -hmm. because you are going to have to bring that with you to a small degree. You know, it's, are you allergic to or do you have a sensitivity to these particular antibiotics or the medicine that you're taking? So really being able to list off the medicines that you take, you know, and it might, it might mean looking at those medicines in your medicine cabinet and writing down a list, and that's part of your emergency kit as well. Mm -hmm. um, and so I, I think that the more we can just think about, you know, the people in my neighborhood, talking to them, asking them, saying, you know, if this event happened, would you want me to pick up medicine for you? And, and they'll probably say, yeah, would you please? And I've got three other people that, you mm -hmm. know, that you could pick it up as well. Mm -hmm. So it, it's really that network. Um, and I think it goes back to what you were talking about with the CERT teams, is what can we do with our own neighbor? What can we do with our own family mm -hmm. and our, our group of friends? And, and that's a big part of preparedness. Mm -hmm. 
and, and we're confident that we would have enough for every single person and their aunt Mary visiting from right. Wichita. Yeah. Okay, so visitors would be covered too. Yeah. It, it, everybody. Everybody. Nobody yep. gets turned away. Nobody gets turned away. And it's not about, you know, if you live in Hernando County or Pasco mm -hmm. County or Ohio, that's not what it's about. It's okay. about getting pills to people. Okay. Yep. And, and people, uh, there will be designated, very well broadcast places to go so people don't need to rush to the hospital no. or to the health department or no. to the sheriff's department or any of those places. Right. What we want is we want them to go to those points of dispensing if they don't, aren't linked into another closed point of dispensing. Yeah, okay. yeah absolutely. Because the hospitals are going to be busy taking care of folks who, who they take care of every day, but then there may be a an influx of other people who are sick as well, so they're going to be doubly busy. Right. And so what we don't want is we don't want a lot of people then going there because they can't help them there. Right. Yeah. Right. They need to go where, where the medicine's being distributed. Okay, I've looked down this uh, pages and pages and page 73. Um, I think we've covered most of what we wanted to talk about. Do, um, Bert, can you think of anything that I might have missed from a law enforcement standpoint that um, we might have wanted to talk about? Or uh, just for the folks listening, you know, just uh, to realize, you know, that we do have a plan. A lot of thought has gone into this. It's, mm -hmm. it's not something that we drew up overnight you know, and just got prepared for this, but uh, we've been working on it for quite some time. Uh, we just want the public to know and feel comfortable that there is a plan in place, and uh, we're prepared to, to help you out as best possible and, and make you as safe and comfortable as possible throughout this ordeal, should it happen, and hopefully it won't. Hopefully it won't, hopefully. yeah. Nina, you've got any last minute things that you need to throw in? I think that really covers it, um, and I just want to say again, if folks are interested in talking with me about becoming a, a point of dispensing, no matter how small the business is or how large it is, no matter how small the group is, um, I'm more than glad to talk with them. Okay, great. Um, and Nina can be reached at the Hernando County Health Department. Her phone number is 540-6822. Um, Bert, you can be reached for law enforcement type questions as it relates to the Strategic National Stockpile at 754-6830, right? Correct. Okay. Um, we have also our websites. Bert, do you all have Strategic National Stockpile stuff on your website, do you know? If it is, it would be on the emergency mm -hmm. management, yeah. but I'm not so sure. We'd have to check on that. And okay. If it's not, I'm sure the emergency management would mm -hmm. Okay. More than likely put it on there. All right. Well, either way, both the health, because I say all that, and then I'm not even sure if we have yeah. it on the health department. <laughs> but if you we are. We will in about three minutes. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> if, you, if you do want to communicate with either of these organizations, you can go to their website, and I'm sure there's a uh, contact information that you could ask any questions that you have. Um, so, again, um, Corporal Burt Stockton, Nina Matei, thank you so much for being with us today. Excellent, You're excellent thank information. You. I'm Ann Gale Ellis. I'm with the Hernando County Health Department. I thank you for joining us today, and I look forward to seeing you again.